Databases. A database seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Ottertune. Google. Hi guys, welcome to the last talk of the semester. Uh, we're excited to have our friend from CreateDB come talk about their data system. Uh, so CreateDB is a tributed data system that came, comes out of Europe. Uh, and so we're always excited to hear about what people are building. Um, so today's speakers is uh, Maria and Marios. Maria did her PhD at uh, TU Darmstadt in computer science. Um, and Marios is a senior software engineer at Create. Uh, at Create. So as always, if you have any questions for our speakers as they're giving the talk, please unmute yourself and ask your question at any time. Would this be a conversation with them and not for them talking to themselves? Uh, and with that, uh, we thank you guys for being here. I will say, so Marios, it is 11.30 PM in Greece where you are. Thank you for staying up. And Maria, it's 10.30 where you are in Germany. Again, it's not the record. Our record is 4 a.m., uh, but it's still wow. pretty late. We're still pretty late, so we appreciate you guys staying up with us. Thank you. So Thank you very you. much. Thank you for having us. Yes. Thank so you for having us. Uh, and, and very nice introduction. So, yeah, today we are going to talk about CreateDB, which is a distributed SQL database built on top of the scene. And as Andy already mentioned, so let's, um, let's introduce us as the speakers. So my name is Maria Selakovic, and yeah, I, I hold PhD in computer science from TU Darmstadt in Germany, and I have been living in Germany for the last eight years, so quite quite some time. But originally, I'm not from Germany, so I'm I come from Serbia, and um, yeah, I did my my undergraduate studies in Belgrade. And today, I work as a developer advocate at Create.io. Um, we are also going to meet Marius Trivizas, who is coming from Greece. And he did his uh, master's degree at Athens University, right? Currently, he's working as a yep. senior software engineer at Create.io, and he's also one of the first uh, engineers at Create.io. So he has a lot of experience uh, with building CreateDB because he has been there since, since a ver very early years. And agenda for today, uh, it's going to be <clears throat> relatively easy to follow. So can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so first we are going to introduce CreateDB. Um, then we are going to talk about um, some main architectural points. Then we are going to deep a little bit, um, uh, we are going a little bit deeper into the storage layer, which is, as, as uh, we already discussed, uh, completely based on the scene. Um, then what is the core and probably the most interesting part of CreateDB distributed query execution that we are also going to mention logical replication and how we implemented this. And finally, we are going to say a few words about deployments and ecosystem because it's, it's quite important when having database, it's very crucial to have a well uh, established ecosystem that works with your database. So what is a CreateDB? Um, CreateDB is one of the uh, leading uh, database solutions for uh, real-time analytics. It's distributed, it's open source, um, and actually it um, supports uh, SQL uh, as, a, as a query language, which is quite important. We learned during the time it's quite important to actually support a language that developers are familiar with and where the learning curve is not that steep. But let's go into more details. We like to mention very often that uh, CreateDB combines the best of SQL and NoSQL. So it also supports Postgres Fire protocol um, for easy uh, onboarding and compatibility with many tools that actually work with Postgres. When we say uh, it uses the best of NoSQL, we usually mean that uh, CreateDB also supports uh, dynamic objects and storing objects in JSON format and also supports dynamic, dynamic schemas. But you can use CreateDB to store and analyze wide variety of data, including relational data, object data, time series data, geospatial data. We already talked about blobs and, of course, full text data. So you sometimes 
sometimes you need two systems, for example, if you want to combine different data data variations, but with CreditD you can you can use one database. Um, scalability is something that CreditDB is has been known for. It supports the concept of uh, horizontal scalability, so you can scale your cluster by just adding new nodes, and um, it's of course. Um, and of course, performance, which is um, always a moving target for us. So since we are based on, on Lucene, um, we aim to, we actually not aim, but also claim that uh, the queries actually can run uh, pretty fast. And we also support aggregations, very fast aggregations by using columnar storage, which we will talk a little bit uh, later on. And CreditDB can also be seen as a, as a distributed search engine since it's built on Apache Lucene. Currently, there are two uh, deployments options. So there is open source uh, version of CreditDB, and um, and there is also cloud version that uh, is available for on more or less major hyperscalers. So you might have said this already, like what you said standard SQL. I mean, there's the Postgres wire protocol. Is it the Postgres SQL dialect or is it something else? Um, yeah, it's actually, so um, CreditDB is, is following more or less the Postgres dialect. There are, there are still some features that are not fully implemented, but we are sure. working on, on, on the Postgres ecosystem in general and full compatibility. But, so it's, it's the Postgres, Postgres grammar. No, uh, sorry, not only, but also the the protocol of the wire connection. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I got that. Got that that's that. why we allow for Postgres tools to connect to CreditDB. Yeah. Even the PSQL client can connect yeah. mm -hmm. to CreditDB. Got it. Thanks. And in general, CreditDB stock how CreditDB stores data. That's usually done in relational format. So when you create a table, it looks more like a um, relational database, but it also allows for storing objects as adjacent documents, like we, have, we can see on this, on this example. And the good thing is that objects can have a very uh, different schemas with arbitrary number of attributes and nesting levels. And what we also store on top of this uh, is original documents in JSON format. So for each uh, row that we store in CreditDB, we store the, um, the JSON representation of this row. And talking about schemas, uh, there are three types to three ways actually to um, declare objects in CreditDB, depending on what type of schema you want to follow. Um, the highest flexibility is given with dynamic schemas where you can add a new columns, um, let's say dynamically, which means if you want to store a new object with a different uh, number of columns, then it has been uh, defined, you can do this. And also new columns as well are going to be indexed. Um, if you want the object to follow the strict schema, you can you can do this um, by declaring the object as strict. Um, so in this case, every added object needs to follow the column definition. And finally, there is another way to declare object which is ignored. Uh, in these cases, you can add a new columns, but these columns are ignored from the indexing point of view, so they are not indexed. And another nice feature of CreditDB is that you can do the database administration by using pure SQL. Um, so there are some um, there are some tables uh, like PG tables that are, that are available, but also information schema tables where you can find uh, data about uh, existing tables, partition, pat partitions, constraints, and columns. Um, and not only that, but also system tables that you can query for, for example, finding out what are the running jobs, uh, what are the finished jobs, uh, information about your cluster and shards. And there is a simple way actually to stop uh, stop a single or um, all jobs um, on, on, a, on, a, on a node. So this is a cool feature in CreditDB because you don't need any 
um, new knowledge actually to the database information. So you can just you can just use uh, SQL as a, as a query language as well. And uh, finally, I think it's it's important also to mention when it's a good what we consider a good uh, use case uh, for KDB and what we don't consider a good use case for KDB. So in our experience, we've seen that KDB is a very good database for time series data, especially IT data or industrial time series data. Uh, then in cases when you need fast queries, aggregations, full text search, SQL as a query language, chaos portal data. We also support logical replication. Uh, compared to many other databases. We have hybrid deployments um, that can actually be um, implemented uh, on, uh, on Kubernetes cluster that, for example, runs in some specific regions. And CreateDB also comes with the promise of high availability and scalability, but it's not a good database if you need transactions. So transactions are not supported. If you have highly hierarchical normalized data models. Uh, so KDB supports joins, which is also a good feature, but joins in distributed settings is a very expensive to execute. And we are going to see how we actually tackle this issue. And in case you need foreign, foreign keys, uh, KDB is not, is not a good database. So let's go to the, <clears throat> to the next topic, which is KDB architecture and the main overview, and I'm giving the word to my colleague, Marius. So hi from me as well. Thanks a lot for joining this session. And let's uh, talk a bit about the uh, general KDB architecture. So as we have uh, stated already, KDB uh, 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 is uh, it's very easy uh, to, to scale with it because uh, it has a said nothing ar architecture. That means that uh, every node of the cluster is equal to each other and can perform exactly the same tasks. Uh, so there is no single point of failure. And if uh, any node fails, then some other can take over uh, its jobs and the cluster can continue working uh, in a healthy state. Um, apart from that, you can uh, scale uh, as your data grows or your requirement grows regarding performance or number of clients querying or inserting to the database by just adding more nodes to add more uh, space, storage, more memory and more CPU power. And the moment that you add a new node to the cluster, you the existing tables that you have defined, their shards are automatically rebalanced in the cluster using the new nodes added. So you don't need to do manually anything to, uh, to uh, rearrange your data across the cluster uh, when you double the number of nodes, for example, or even if you add just a couple more of them. Uh, just to say a, a bit more, I, I, I won't go into details of that, but there are uh, much more complex uh, uh, configurations you can do. So there are nodes that have the uh, master coordinator role in the cluster, and uh, maybe you have all the nodes be able to take that role, but also you can configure that only a subset of the nodes that maybe don't even have uh, much storage space and they just do the coordination, take the role of the master, and then you have data nodes. You can also have uh, only cl client only nodes, which uh, responsibility is basically like a load balancer to service the clients in front of the actual cluster performing the operations. We have a question from the audience, Kevin. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so my my question is um, within a single node, uh, is the architecture also shared nothing, uh, or um, does every like physical CPU core and OS thread get its own independent like buffer pool and memory, uh, or is there a shared memory architecture where where uh, for a single node all of the memory is shared across them? 
every node has its own memory, but this memory is shared across all operations that the node does regarding clustering or inserting data or executing query. There are, of course, some thread pools there. So each thread pool has some uh, responsibility, for example, like some internal scheduled jobs or uh, the inserts with the searches, the queries are different search pools, but that's it. Got it. So it's one big like buffer pool and one big application level scheduler per node. And that's shared amongst all the, the threads and CPU cores that run on that node. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. Again, there you can also, you can just influence the number of threads in the thread pools. Uh, but yeah, you, you, you can influence some things and configure it. But in general, it's a shared uh, thing, as we said. Yeah. So Shared, sorry, shared nothing architecture was sort of like the way to build things 10 years ago. But certainly in the cloud now, everyone is moving to a shared disk. Uh, and I think this would make sense in analytics, right? Because it's, it's you're trying to store a lot of data, although you obviously want to keep things, if, you know, with the scene, you're indexed and, you know, you would keep that local. Have you thought about, you know, have, you know maybe you'll get to this. Is there a cloud version of create DB where like it now becomes shared disk where you're storing things on S3 or even EBS or is it the it, it is it's somehow using Lacene require you to be a shared shared nothing architecture uh yeah like to to have a, a good performance uh, you you have to do, have uh, local disks and actually SSD disks or now even NVMe disks to get the best uh, out of it so you can use uh, uh, cloud storage like S3 for snapshots and to, uh, we have this uh, idea uh, to uh, be able also to to search on those snapshots on S3 uh, to have slow searches of course on like, let's say archived historical data to give this opportunity but definitely you don't get the performance you get with the Lucene on the local disk. Maybe, maybe Maria said this and I missed this. Like you're trying to do real-time analytics. So what is your notion of real time? What's the like what's the target P99 that is, is the sweet spot for you guys? So can, can you repeat again, please? So so you're you're doing you're trying to target real-time analytics. So it's not you're not trying to replace Redshift, you're not trying to replace Snowflake, where they can just do big sequential scans over large chunks of data. You're mm -hmm. you're going to be using the scene as the index. So therefore, you're trying to target queries that are fast. I don't understand. Like when you guys say real time, is that like in the hundreds of milliseconds range or something less? Like I'm trying to understand like what's the what's the target SLA you guys are trying to provide? And obviously it depends on the query and the data, but I'm I'm just curious. Um yeah, that as you said, it depends on the situation. How how first of all, um what is the throughput of inserts and updates you want to support together with the real time because of course when you increase uh, the throughput that you're going to get then you don't see the your data immediately there is this mm -hmm. concept in uh, in lucene uh, the refresh rate the, the refresh um, uh, time so the data that you insert becomes available after let's say one second or 10 seconds or 100 okay. milliseconds so it's something that you configure but the less you configure it the the more you decrease the performance of inserts and updates, of course. Okay, awesome, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, as, as an overview for the stack of the architecture, what you will see in each of the CreateDB nodes, nodes, and let's start from the bottom. You have your clients that connect to the cluster through either the HTTP endpoint or the SQL, Postgres SQL wire protocol. And each statement, either it's the DML, DDL, or administration statement, uh, goes through the parser. The parser, of course, parses the SQL and validates the, the syntax there and creates an abstract syntax tree, which is then passed to the analyzer, which knows a bit more about uh, the tables that are available, the columns, the privileges, and so on, and does uh, semantic processing, checks data types, and all these things that you can do before runtime, before the actual execution, I mean. 
and then it passes you to the planner and optimizer which has several stages so first you create a we will see it later but first you create a logical plan you optimize it and then an execution plan and then you actually send it to the uh, distributed execution engine of this this node that you have connected uh, which will in turn uh, use its uh, local Lucene storage to store locally things and also uh, transport data and requests to other nodes in the cluster to fulfill your statement. Uh, so regarding, so, so, yeah. Sorry, uh, so going back, the, is the query optimizer, is that written from scratch or are you guys relying on CalSight? No, it's written from scratch. Got it, okay. Um, and is it, do you know what it's like, I mean, are you doing cost-based search? Uh, we do some basic uh, things at the moment. So we do some ana uh, anal analysis on the table to get statistics regarding number of rows and like average uh, length uh, of every row in bytes to, or to decide for some things. Yeah, but uh, it's not uh, sophisticated. Okay. It's not sophisticated. Then... It has some decisions and some optimizations, uh, especially in the subquery area and joins. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will see also a bit later about filter push down and limits and so okay. uh, maybe you can hold a bit the questions and ask me. Okay. Uh, all right, thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, so um, when it comes to node to node communication, then there is one more protocol, a network protocol for CreditDB. We call it transport protocol, and it's a. Uh, uh, dedicated to uh, communicate requests and data between the nodes and you can also enable encryption for each one of those protocols so only for postgres only for http only for transport for two of them or for all of them and the configuration uh, it's uh, done via host based authentication you can use trust and certificate authentication methods and uh, of course uh, when you enable uh, one of those protocols or two or three as i said this applies to the whole cluster so you cannot have two nodes uh, working with un unencrypted http and all of the others with encrypted or transport between specific nodes to be encrypted and with others not so it, it applies to the whole cluster so next uh, we will talk just a bit about the storage layer which is just lucene so um, when you uh, define a table and you start inserting data into it then all of your data gets indexed by default uh, you have the possibility to disable uh, indexing for uh, certain fields if you uh, never gonna search by them to uh, gain some speed for insert updates and also some uh, space. Uh, so for uh, text values, Lucene uses an inverted index. We'll see a few more details uh, next. And for all numerical values and including all types like timestamps, geo points, geo shapes, that internally they use numeric numerical values uh, using block KD trees for the indices. Uh, on top of the uh, indexing every field uh, for all uh, the the fields, you also have the column-based data storage of Lucene, uh, which is an uh, called uh, doc values and this is what provides uh, very fast sorting and aggregations and currently you can disable these doc values columnar storage only for text fields uh, but not for numerical and we are planning to do it soon it's in our radar to save even more space for fields that you don't need it uh, so let's talk uh, a bit more about the uh, uh, text index and first uh, we'll talk uh, about the full uh, about the anal analysis of uh, full text index which comes first so when you have a large document before you start uh, indexing it uh, you need to split it uh, into tokens um, 
then uh, you have to uh, maybe apply some uh, filters on those, to those tokens and maybe also on top some character filters. So all of these components uh, compra uh, cons uh, compra comprise, oh, sorry, I'm missing the word, the uh, analyzer. And uh, there is some standard uh, analyzers that you can use, but also you can define your own. Uh, you can define your own tokenizer as well and combine the filters that you want to do your job. So I will show just an example uh, of um, the standard analyzer uh, for English. So first you just split all your the tokens with the white spaces and you get the words. Then you just lowercase everything, and the other thing is that you remove the remove the stop words like the end and words like that that uh, are not useful when you're searching for. So uh, next uh, we will see how now we index this data. So before we see the the tokenized version, uh, le, let's see what happens when you have uh, defined a uh, normal text index without uh, analysis step before. And in our table, you can see this uh, model field and you have almond milk, almond flour and milk. And this text with the plain index just get indexed uh, as a total phrase, as the whole string and you just point to the document IDs that this uh, phrase can be found in. But uh, when you are using the full text and you have done the tokenizing analysis filtering and everything, you can see that uh, you have the, your uh, token split and you see that the token almond, uh, you, you can be found document IDs one and two and milk in one and three and flower only in document two. So in this way, when you start searching for terms like that, you can very fast uh, refer to the documents that uh, uh, those values can be found. And on top, of course, with Lucene, you can do much more complicated things with phrase searching and fuzzy logic and wildcards, prefixes, suffixes, and so on. And scoring, so you can, uh, use uh, uh, you can define how the documents that you have matched are returned in uh, an ordering regarding which are the more relevant to your uh, query. And for the doc values, as we said, is sort of the uh, columnar uh, storage of Lucene, and its numeric uh, value gets uh, uh, its uh, doc values uh, index. Uh, so basically what happens is that uh, you have uh, you can very easily and quickly access all the values of a certain field like the quantity here and you have them related to document IDs and uh, what makes it fast is that uh, you can have a query that you filter out things and you decide that this is a subset of document IDs that match my query and then directly you can get a very fast iterator over the the values of the quantity field over the IDs that you have pre-selected, pre-filtered. And also you can uh, do very fast uh, um, aggregations of numeric ones like average, sums, min, max with that. Um, so like, for, all, yep. for, sorry, for all those things like the like the sorting the the <clears throat> sorry I mean, the query execution is that being done by Lucene or like is that done by Crate like is is Crate the like, Crate's gonna do a query say it's gonna do a sequential scan or something right like on and the data is in Lucene you're just reading the data of Lucene as a, as a bunch of vectors and then do the query processing in in your code or can you push those filters and everything down into Lucene. Yeah, yeah, it's it's both actually. So there are okay. many things that can be done by Lucene, and we will see next that we will try to push down as many things in the Lucene to get advantage of the index to avoid doing uh, processing in the CradeDB nodes. But okay. of course, okay. when you are you have like custom logic and operators, 
uh, on the fields and you you don't have simple uh, filterings then of course you need to do all this work in CreateDB. Um, so um, uh, regarding compression because of course uh, you can uh, not have all these uh, indices for each field and the dog values on top uh, uh, with uh, plain storage uh, otherwise you will need tons of uh, of space in the disk uh, your credit b uses two compression algorithms the default is lz4 which is more or less a good uh, trade-off between the storage efficiency and the and the performance both query but also inserts and uh, also deflate which is much more aggressive um, uh, compression but it comes at a cost both for inserts and queries and on top also the doc values are there are several techniques that are used there regarding the numeric type the numeric ranges and so on uh, to compress them so there, it's, there is delta encoded if you have many values that are very close to each other it's also there can be bit packing or GCD common uh, divisor compression. And uh, we have made some tests in the past uh, to compare KDB with Postgres regarding the storage requirements. So I had uh, this table with a variety of different fields with 120 millions of rows in it. And uh, there were only two uh, indices for uh, on, on time and device ID enabled uh, also for Postgres, of course, to compare it. And here is a comparison with uh, the two algorithms of compression for KDB and for Postgres SQL. And next, uh, we will talk a bit about the query execution engine and about plans. So um, uh, as we said before, uh, after the analyzer, we go to the planner and the first fair, uh, step of the planner is to create a logical plan. And we'll take the very simple query uh, here, like the select name from users. And for every uh, query and statement, basically you can add uh, the uh, explain prefix and you can get the logical plan for it so we just select uh, here a field name from the table users and this uh, translates to the logical plan which is uh, an operation collect so this is to go to lucene to the users indices and retrieve the name and the true here is the filtering because there is no filtering, so basically it's return everything. Um, so if we just add uh, uh, a plain filter in the word close where name equals uh, a literal string name, then you just see it uh, being added here. And this is uh, the query expression that it's pushed down to Lucene to the indices and translates to a Lucene term query in order to return the documents that you want. Uh, so no, uh, as we said before with your question, um, we try to filter, to push down uh, all the filters that we can down to the Lucene level to take advantage of the indices. And a simple example here when uh, you have just a subquery, a nested query, and uh, you have uh, filtering on the age in the inner one and the filtering on the name on the outer one, then the logical planner co can combine it uh, with an end and create a, a Lucene terms query again with an end and get advantage of uh, the index. Um, so after the logical plan and these optimizations that happen then you have to create the physical execution plan that it's actually going to be executed in the 
uh, execution engine on the nodes of the cluster. So the logical plan we have seen before, even with the optimi optimization, uh, doesn't know anything about uh, the data distribution at this point. So it doesn't know where your SARPs are located because normally every ta table, you, you will have at least three nodes, let's say in your cluster for redundancy and to sustain a, a failure. Uh, you will cluster it with minimum three SARPs and get one SARP to the node. So um, uh, the, the planner that needs to create the execution plan now needs to go into the routing table of the cluster, which holds all the information about where the SARPs are located, which nodes, and create the execution plan and asks for the nodes to retrieve data. Uh, of course, keep in mind that apart from the uh, primary SARPs in CreditB, you can also configure one or more replica SARPs. So if you have, uh, if you define, for example, three replicas, then you have three times three, you have nine SARPs in total. And then you also can have some round robin algorithm for your queries to not um, access the same SARPs for every client that... Uh, uh, runs a query on the same table so you get a round robin uh, behavior and also you get some statistics about the current uh, pressure of the cluster regarding cpu and uh, two thre um, threads two threads to decide where to uh, forward your requests uh, for Every execution plan, the nodes that uh, participate in uh, the execution uh, can be divided, are divided into three uh, roles. So there are the collect nodes, uh, there are the nodes that hold uh, the Lucene indices, the SARDs, where uh, the data is gathered with filterings, orderings that are pushed down. Uh, you have the merge nodes. So these are the nodes that uh, retrieve results from the collect nodes and merge them. Or there can be one or several merge nodes de uh, depending on the operation and the number of nodes and SARPs. And there is only 100 nodes. It's the one that communicates with the client, the one that the client has originally submitted the query, the statement, and it's responsible to gather all the data from the merge nodes and return the bug. For simple cases, uh, the merge node uh, can be also the handler node. So you, you only have one merge node, you have maybe several collect nodes to retrieve data, but merge and handler node are all the same and so on that the client connects to. Uh, let's uh, uh, now see a bit more regarding the uh, execution, the physical plan. So we saw the logical plan for this simple query. And if we, uh, if you do an explain analyze as a prefix, then you get the actual execution plan where you can also, you also get uh, timings here for each operation because it actually executes the query for you and you get timings and you can see also which part of your query is the one, the bottleneck. So for, uh, this simple one, uh, we see that it's routed to two nodes, uh, node 0, node 1. The node 0 holds SART 0 and 1 of the table users. Node 1 holds the 2 and, th and 3 SART of the table. And for uh, both of them, you request to fetch the value for the name field. So the merge phase is... Uh, uh, done, for example, in node zero, can be also the handler node where the client has connected. This has two upstreams, which in this simple case, one of the upstreams can be also the node itself. It's the same node because it holds shards of the table that we have, we have queried. So when uh, it receives data from the other node and from itself, from the operator executing, then it merges them and sends them back to the client. Uh, now let's see a bit uh, 
just a bit more complex query when you have an order by and a limit. So notice here that uh, already the logical plan becomes a bit more uh, complex. And uh, if we start from the bottom, which is again the first operation that it's executed in Lucene. For the um, users table, now you request this special uh, internal field called fed, fetch ID together with the ID. Uh, you send down the uh, the filter that you want on the name, and uh, you uh, ask to order by ID, which is also will be done by Lucene. This is the order by that we have, and then you apply the limit, and then you apply the final feds. So let's talk a bit about this fed thing. Um, <clears throat> since yeah, you can have tables with many fields or even a few fields, but very large fields like texts or geo shapes and things like that, uh, it's important that you don't send, uh, you avoid sending around data that it's not needed so when you are executing a query like that instead of returning back the fields name and names that you have requested uh, you ask for lucene to generate this internal feds id for each of those documents and this uh, feds id it's um, uh, somehow combination it encodes the SARD as well together with an eternal document ID and I don't mean uh, sorry I don't mean this ID which is a field we have defined but an internal document ID so when uh, you have applied the limit because you don't want to return like 10,000 or 10 million rows but only 50 then you have the fetch IDs that you want and then is where you go back to the to Lucene to the nodes and you execute the fetch operation to retrieve the actual data for these um, fetch IDs and uh, just uh, to, to say a bit more about this uh, limit uh, you can you see that when you have a limit of uh, 50 then since you have many shards you push this limit to all of the nodes so you get 50 nodes for each of them and uh, they are ordered and in the merge node you just keep the top 50 to return back to to the client and since we are uh, with the questions yeah we're a bit uh, over time i will go a bit quicker through the joins so create the uh, supports joins. Uh, the default algorithm is nested loop. I don't need to explain more about nested loop. It's very clear to why? all of the <laughs> database what? people. Why? why? The, the default join algorithm is nested loop? Yes, because uh, we, uh, we haven't invested a lot in the joins. We will see next okay. about the hash join. Uh, okay. So the default for to support all cases where you have complex join conditions with you know greater uh, less and not uh, equal joins, uh, um, you have to go to nested loop. We haven't implemented any sorted merge or uh, this kind of algorithms uh, up to now. Uh, so even for the nested loop, we have a distributed logic there. So we have several nodes executing the nested loop. And for each node that uh, that does a portion, you have to broadcast shards for uh, from other nodes in order to do the portion of um, uh, the nested loop. So of course, uh, uh, if you have uh, the shard one of the left table to this node, you have to to receive all the shards of the right table in order to uh, to go through them and execute uh, the nested loop. And at the end you have the merging of those uh, results. And for equi joins, um, quite some time ago, we have implemented a block has join algorithm. So you have the first, the build phase where you try from the, sorry, 
uh, from the stats, as we said uh, earlier, that you have, you uh, scan the smaller table in terms of memory that it will use, uh, and you create hashes and you store them in the hash table, and then you probe all the rows of the of the other table using this um, this hash table. And of course, you are using blocks because maybe if your table can be small, but not small enough to fit in the available memory. So uh, you might need to have multiple blocks and build multiple hash tables uh, to, to be able to fit um, finally the table into the memory. And also the block has join uh, is, can be executed in the distributed fashion. So what happens is that uh, beforehand, you do a hashing and a modulo on the rows and you distribute them to the nodes that you have decided to execute the block has join. And every node receives the rows that uh, potentially will match. The, it, it, it cannot miss any rows with this initial hashing. And then each node performs its portion of the block has join and then you have the merge phase where you merge the results. And for all these um, operations, uh, CreditDB supports two methods of communicating data between the nodes. So you have the direct response and the paging. Uh, so uh, automatically it selects what uh, seems to be ideal for the situation regarding the nodes, the shards are participating, the number of expecting data, if you have limits and so on. And uh, you can see it basically in this graph that when you have a direct response in this communication, let's say that node zero receives the initial query from the user and needs to send a request to node one to get data or execute something. So uh, the, for the direct response, you just get the result as a response to your job request from node one. But uh, when you have larger amounts of data, you cannot transfer that this way. So instead you use paging and um, the, the steps in the communication become a bit more complicated because in this situation, node zero will send, first send the job request to the node one. The node one would just acknowledge with no data. And when it has some data available in a sync function, it will send the first page to node zero. Node zero will process and uh, it will ask for the next page from node one, which will send it and so on. And all these communications um, are asynchronously. So you have listeners and futures and uh, you, you will get at some point the response from node one with data and start continue processing. So uh, if you have some questions, maybe now for the execution engine before we proceed with Maria to the next chapters. Or we can also do it in the end. Yeah, there is not much left actually. So we wanted to mention logical replication since we were talking about built-in replications already. So do you prefer uh, doing some short Q&A? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I said keep, keep going, we'll do a Q&A at the end. Oh, okay, awesome. Oh, so logical replication. So we, we were talking about built-in replication on the shard level, but also CreditDB allows you to <clears throat> replicate um, tables or subset of tables from uh, one cluster to another. It follows publish subscribe model where publishers are clusters that make data available to publications and subscribers are clusters that actually receive data and not only data replicated, but also uh, the operation Operations such as inserting, deleting, updating, and changing schemas are also replicated to the, to the subscriber cluster. So syntax is relatively simple, also follows um, SQL. Uh, so can you go to the next slide? Um, so you create publications by specifying whether you want to create a 
to make this data available for all tables that are on the cluster, only for subset of tables. And during this process, you are you don't actually uh, you are you cannot do aggregations. Um, on on the other side, you can create subscription that actually make a connection uh, to a publishing cluster. And uh, you can also specify currently one parameter called enable, um, which actually says whether you would like your subscriber to be actively replicating. So, and currently the data on subscriber cluster are read only. So it goes only one way. And we have seen a couple of interesting use cases for uh, this, uh, this feature, which has been available since I believe May or June this year. Um, the one is actually for improving one use case aims to improve data locality. So imagine that you have one central reporting cluster and you want to make data uh, closer to the to the applications that are actually uh, using this data. So you can, for example, uh, replicate the data to the regions, to the clusters residing in regions that are closer closer to application data. And in this case, uh, actually, you can achieve, we can achieve a much lower latency because uh, the data you need for your applications are, are actually closer to you. Uh, another interesting use case um, is something related to the, to the analytics. And can we just uh, mention this quickly on the next slide? So in this in this use case, uh, we are actually allowing um, replication of data from different distant regions to one central reporting cluster. Very interesting and, and common use case because you sometimes would like to aggregate all the data that uh, you might need for your analytics in one central cluster that is closer to this analytics instead of querying uh, the data across different regions. And you don't need to do this querying across multiple sources. You do this uh, from a single source, and also you can also you also have a control which data you would like to replicate to central reporting cluster. So you need don't need to to query actually all of them. Um, before actually finishing for today, we would like to give a few words about deployment uh, that we that we have currently and ecosystem in general. So I already mentioned at the very beginning uh, that we have two deployment options. Um, first one, open source CreDB is available under Apache license uh, 2.0. And as it's open source, you can just run it on any hardware you would like, but we also have a cloud version um, that is available on more or less all major hyperscalers. And uh, we also have um, recent, we also recently um, licensed under, under Apache license, uh, the Crate operator, which is actually a piece of software that you can use to deploy CreDB on Kubernetes cluster residing in a region of your choice. Um, and yeah, if you're some of those people who like to contribute to open source software, I just would like to invite you to check out these GitHub repositories. Um, so we mentioned ecosystem, uh, CreDB definitely supports Postgres file protocol. There are, there are definitely some limitations uh, that I briefly mentioned, but when it comes to the features that we do, still do not support, which doesn't mean we won't. Um, so currently what is available in Postgres but not in CreDB is um, time without the time zone. So this is something that we still don't support. Uh, we also do not have option to uh, for declaration and, and usage of multi-dimensional arrays. And um, another feature that is also quite often used in, in Postgres, but still not uh, supported in, grade, in grade B is uh, interval input units, for example, milliseconds or, or microseconds. And on this slide, you can also see the, uh, how we implement Postgres interface and there are a couple of other limitations that we are still working on. So like it's Postgres compatible, but not 100%. And let's go to the next slide to just say what is next for us. 
So CreateDB has many interesting features, but of course there is a lot of things to do. First of all, first of all um, we believe that ecosystem needs to, to improve and we are working also hard to facilitate CreateDB integrations with other systems and tools, not only Polygos compatible tools, but uh, other tools as well. Um, we also have, we didn't, we didn't mention in this, in this presentation because uh, there was no um, time. Um, we, CreateDB has a functionality to uh, read data from external file system or local file system and to write as well. Uh, this is done through copy from and to statements, and we are currently working on improving user experience and functionality of these statements. And I think what Marius already mentioned, there is a lot of optimizations that are on our checklist. Definitely, we would like to improve insert performance. So the query queries are quite fast. Uh, insert is um, relatively doing well, uh, except in some cases. And uh, there is also this notion of Lucene flash that takes some time until data are available on the disk. And when it comes to this with query execution, especially joins, uh, further optimizations are, are in plan. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you all for your uh, time, invitation, and attention. If you have any other questions, um, not only now, but also after, after the, 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 the Q and A, just be free to, to send us emails or to join our community and ask questions there. So maybe now we can okay. go to yeah, the so I'll, I'll, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll clap that for everyone else. All right, perfect, awesome. Uh, we actually have time for, for a few questions. So if anybody in the audience wants to go for it, go ahead. Meet yourself and fire away. Otherwise, I'll be selfish and I'll, and I'll use all the time for questions. Okay, cool. Um, so I guess the my first question would be again, and this is maybe me, me not having any, any experience with Lucene, but how does how do you enforce integrity constraints? Is that all done at the crate level, or will Lucene do that for you? Like you know, for example, you showed the the object type, and you had you know there's a notion of strictness there. Is that being done by Lucene, or it's, you have to do it? You have to you have to actually look at the data as it comes in before you show it to Lucene. Yeah, you have to do it. Uh, yeah, at create DB level, <clears throat> you can yeah, also yeah. Um, you uh, you can also define constraints on every field, like not null or not only this uh, complex uh, calculations expression with operators like modulo this plus this equals greater than whatever. Yeah. So all all these yeah uh, are done before you. Uh, send the data to be indexed in Lucene. And then Lucene has a notion, they have their own sort of type system, right? So you have to make sure that create at least matches the primitives and the more complex things you guys handle up there. Sorry, can you repeat that? Like, so, the, so there's a type system, right? The Lucene yeah. probably has their own internal system, but you guys yeah, yeah. match, you, you, match what Postgres does. You need to does. translate it. Yeah, you need to translate it to what Postgres supports. Regarding okay. big decimals or things like that, yeah, you need to do the translation from the SQL data types to, yeah, and also in some cases in between you have the Java thing because CreateDB is written in Java, so sometimes you don't even have exact compatibility. The uh, special case is the interval, for example. We support mm -hmm. intervals, not uh, in storing them in scene, but. Uh, doing calculations and having an interval type as a result, like subtracting time sums. So yeah, in SQL interval is very specific and does you don't have this thing in either Java time or Zoda time. And you need somehow to make the translation in Java for this thing. Got it, okay. Um, what is something you wish you, what is something, so presumably you guys are, you're not a hard fork of Lucene, right? You're 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 following along their main line, so you get all the optimizations and new things that they support. Is that or or, or do you guys do a hard fork? I didn't get sorry. Sorry, 
for Lucene, did you do a hard fork on their repository of the source code, or are you are you embedding them and always using whatever the latest version that they put out? Ah, uh, yeah, no, we are we're using the the latest version, but okay, yeah, yeah, we, so we use it as a library as a dependency, but yeah, yeah. yeah. of yeah, course sorry. we have some some classes that we override when it comes to this data type mapping thing that you mentioned. Yes. But yeah, mainly we just uh, update and uh, you have to adjust in most cases just uh, small parts of the code to adapt to the new version and the new features. Got it. So okay. it's quite backwards compatible. Then you need to see if the new features somehow you can use them now and push down more filters, the queries, or yes. yeah. So what's up? Is there anything you if, if you could change one thing of the scene? To make create be better is can you can you is there something you wish it had that it doesn't have now mm. Mm, there is a there is a thing that it's very tricky yes and it's the null concept uh, so yeah. you see does it have the null concept and uh, whenever you uh, do queries with is null is not null then uh, this is filtering you need to execute with CreditDB code. So you go to Lucene and then Lucene has a callback to the CreditDB code to execute the filtering, which is, of course, much more inefficient than doing a filtering on Lucene itself. And then the null thing that it's very, very common in the relational database world, uh, it, it's not cheap because uh, of this restriction, not restriction, uh, but the way Lucene uh, didn't support it from the beginning as a concept. And uh, this flash, actually, is Lucene flash that makes uh, it available on disk sometimes is maybe taking quite some time. Um, because we have seen with a couple of customers actually complaining about insert performance. It's not for all data, usually not for all types of data, but like there's sometimes use cases where this doesn't work as expected and takes yeah. some time until data are available on the disk scan. This is maybe not something yeah. that Lucene doesn't have or has, but um, it's something that maybe could be improved in the future. Got it. Okay, and then so my last question is, um, is you guys are the only database system we've had this semester that's written in Java. Actually, Victor, you have a quick question. Uh, just uh, what's the best practice to improve, for database design to improve the nested loop uh, join? What's the best method to improve nested loop join? Yeah, I put in the chat. Yeah, so because the join might be the best nested loop, right? Usually for a large amount of data, that's going to take a long time. Okay. So. What is the key design principle to improve that? Possible? And how to one? create your database? No, no, no. I, he's asking how how can you make a nested loop join run faster? And the answer is not run nested loop join. Like <laughs> yes, <laughs> worth one, right? There's nothing you can do. And especially um, not run joins on multiple tables. That could be very slow. Yeah, I I mean Victor, the answer is hash join is almost almost always superior. Especially if, if you have to have good desk. Um, I watch the class lecture. We we cover this. Okay. Um, so my last question, my last question is again, you guys are the only uh you know, database system that's written in Java we had this semester. Um it's been all Rust, C, one somebody in Zig. Um, and so you guys are are almost 10 years old now. And is there anything that you know in, in over in over the years, last decade of, of the iterations of Java? Is there anything that has that that's improved in the JVM or the JDK or, or you know the Java ecosystem that has made things better for CreateDB? And that can be either in terms of performance or software engineering. Um, <clears throat> for JVM, definitely the the, the garbage. Uh, collection the G1 CC when it became the standard stable uh, made an impact for sure. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And uh, now with uh, Java uh, 19, there is this improvement with mapped uh, FS or so 
which uh, we haven't tested so far, but uh, Lucene is recommended to start using it at least for to test it. So we are planning to have benchmark with this thing. We haven't done it yet because it was like two weeks ago that we we moved master to Java 19, so we didn't have the chance to test it so far. Got it. Okay. And yeah, code wise, there, there are some improvements, uh, but in general, they are not those that make the the big impact. And there are many things like the streaming interface, the streams, that in many times it's much slower when you do the uh, the micro benchmarking uh, to, uh, instead of writing, uh, you know, verbosing the for loops and doing some filtering there. Okay. 